So is Sarit. So Major Reserve Zehavi served for over 14 years in the Israeli Defense Force, specialized in military intelligence corps, and she is specialized on the northern border of Israel from uh, uh, Lebanon, Syria, and on. Actually, Sarit lives six miles, yes? We, uh, six miles uh, from the Lebanon border in a place called Kfar Vardim. Kfar Vardim, it's in the western uh, Galilee. It's a beautiful place if you've ever been there. Weather almost like in Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> the closest that you can get in Israel for Cleveland. Um, Sarit, uh, since she was in the army, she retired a few years ago, and since then she's opened, um, uh, uh, she has her own uh, uh, program, it's called ALMA, it's named after her daughter, their younger daughter, and uh, ALMA really focused to try to educate people and students on what happened in Israel and in the surrounding. Sarit prepared for us, for the teens, she prepared four core uh, issues about the Middle East, and we're working with the teens, and we're working with our uh, Israeli emissary called Shinshinim, really, to take it, to learn, and to move it forward. There is a few high school students here, and at least two of them met Sarit in Israel, and that's how we met Sarit, and we felt that it's great that she will come here, and I think that she, it was great. So, Sarit Zavi, welcome. I want to begin with a small uh, story because we, we got the title of the, of the lecture, uh, The Enemy of My Enemy Isn't My Friend. Now, uh, I don't know if you heard <coughs> this phrase before, but what happened is that um, a few months ago I gave a lecture about uh, the same topic in Israel. It was a different lecture because the rapid development in the Middle East enabled me to always talk differently. And, uh, but the, the title was the same, the enemy of my, my enemy isn't my friend, and I screened that, and at the moment someone uh, jumped and said, this is Netanyahu, he just said that uh, to the Congress. <laughs> and I said, really? I'm saying that for months. <laughs> so he probably copied that for me. <laughs> so honestly, I didn't hear Netanyahu uh, on, uh, on live when he said that. I was too busy in different lectures. But uh, I think in that point, uh, he was right. Uh, you can't use these sentences in the Middle East, the enemy of my, the enemy, of my enemy is my friend, etc. We're going to see how it goes today and maybe talk about some more versions of, of, this, of this sentence. So the day before Paris, the day before Paris happened another event that I don't know if you've heard of, which was very important in the Middle East. The day before Paris, uh, the attacks in Paris, there was another attack of ISIS uh, in Beirut. While thousands of people got killed in the Shiite suburb of Beirut, uh, named Dachia, which is a place that probably even Nasrallah is hiding somewhere, or most senior commanders of, of Hezbollah and leaders of Hezbollah are living. It's a Hezbollah place. And ISIS managed to get into the heart of this place and uh, kill 40 people. But actually, in the Lebanese-Syrian border, there is a war uh, that is going on for a few years between Hezbollah uh, and ISIS or ISIS alike, Al-Qaeda, for example. Uh, and of course, the question is whether who is winning. Well, you know, it depends which day you ask. But uh, in the past few months, Hezbollah is winning. Uh, got, managed to get ceasefire in some of the places and managed to push uh, some of these uh, Al-Qaeda or ISIS forces uh, a little bit farther into, into Syria. Now, why are they fighting each other? I think this is the main question. Why is it uh, Hezbollah vis-a-vis ISIS and not Hezbollah and ISIS. The answer lies in that. This is a very colorful map. It's like a rainbow. Uh, this is the complexity, the religious complexity of Lebanon. Now, first of all, uh, why does it matter 
Why religious complexity it matter? In the United States, you also have religious complexity. It matters because this is the key to understand what is going on uh, in the Middle East in general, in Lebanon in particular. Uh, Lebanon is the country where, due to the constitution, the prime minister will always be Sunni, the head of parliament will always be Shiite, and uh, the president will always be Christian. When you look at that map, you see this is the border with Israel. Amnon mentioned I live over here. And the purple is for the Shiite population in Lebanon. The green is for different Sunni population. The blue, different colors of blue, is for the Druze population, and the red is for the Christians. So it is very well mixed, though in South Lebanon, where it is bordering with Israel, most of the population are Shiite, meaning that most of the population support Hezbollah, since Hezbollah is a Shiite organization. Same map for Iraq. Same issue. Uh, the yellow one is, is a desert. Ugh. The yellow one is a desert. The red one are Kurds, which is an ethnic group in Iraq. Uh, the blue is Sunni, and the green is mainly a, a Shiite. Dark green is mainly Shiite population. Very complex uh, population in Iraq. Why does that matter? It matters because this is one of the reasons there is civil war in Iraq today. Saddam Hussein, which was overthrown by the United States 13 years ago, <coughs> was Sunni. So the Sunni population, which is 35% of the population in Iraq, uh, was used to get in its own share of the cake during the years. After Saddam Hussein was overthrown, we tried to establish democracy in Iraq. Most of the population are Shiite. So a Shiite government was elected due to the opinion of the majority. But this Shia government actually prosecuted the Sunnis in Iraq. And this was a very, uh, this frustration of the Sunnis in Iraq was a very uh, a great fertile land to ISIS, for ISIS to grow. That's exactly the place. Now at the beginning, ISIS, which is a Sunni organization, was a branch of Al-Qaeda, also a Sunni organization. Uh, it was 2006, it was established as the Islamic State in Iraq. Branch of Al-Qaeda. Later, uh, it had difficult times fighting with the Americans. But in 2011, the Americans left. And when the Americans left, it was easier to ISIS, along with a very charismatic leader, uh, to take over the main cities in Iraq, and the rest is history. You're probably familiar with that a little bit. But it all uh, growing on the grassroots of deep rivalry between Shiites and Sunnis in the Middle East. It's not something that is uh, growing without any background. The same issue is with Syria. It's the same thing in Syria. Mixed population, the yellow is for the Sunni, the green uh, is for the Shiite, the purple is for the Druze, and there are many more colors which I'm not going to elaborate. Most of the population in Syria are Sunnis. But the regime, the Assad regime, is a kind of a stream of the Shiite. Again, meaning there is an inherent rivalry between the dictatorship of the Assad regime and the Sunni population who suffered from this dictatorship during the years. So this is a very good, fertile land to a civil war to develop. To develop. And that's why the Sunni-Shiite conflict is the main conflict in the Middle East today. It's not the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It's not. This is the conflict. The main wars in the Middle East today are in Iraq and in Syria and in Yemen. If you open the website of Hezbollah, for example, in Arabic, you always have in each website, you always have um, 
topics that you can go in depth and learn a little bit more about them, topics that are important for those who are managing the website, Hezbollah website, one of the main topics is the war in Yemen, or in their words, Saudi crimes in Yemen. Another country, Saudi Arabia, trying to be the leader of the Shiite world. What happened in the past few weeks? I've said that the Middle East always supply me with different uh, point of views and things that I can talk about in my lectures. So in the past few weeks, there were lots of news concerning this uh, Shiite Sunni conflict. First of all, this handsome guy, uh, which was uh, a prominent uh, uh, rebel from the opposition, probably one of the religious organizations in Syria that was supported by Saudi Arabia, he got killed uh, by the alliance of Russia, Iran, and the Assad regime. A few days later, Saudi Arabia executed this guy, Nimr, Sheikh Nimr, who is the Shiite leader uh, of, the, of the Shiites in Saudi Arabia, inside Saudi Arabia, was in prison for a few years, was sentenced to die a few years ago, and uh, two weeks ago, Saudi Arabia decided to execute him. In my point of view, it was a reaction to the assassination against the rebel one in Syria. What Iran did, Iran, the leader of the Shiite world, couldn't stay in quiet. So, Demonstrators in Iran burned the Saudi embassy in Tehran. Now, the Iranian president denounced this attack against the Saudi embassy in Tehran, but if you can speak a little bit of the language in the Middle East, you can understand that this denouncement was nothing. He sent them to do that. In response, Saudi Arabia announced that it is going to uh, disconnect the relationship with Iran and every day on the news you hear uh, that they are going to disconnect the relationship in different aspects. You hear attacks from both sides, uh, how each side is the one who actually support terror, who actually support extremism, who actually the one that is responsible to the terrible conflict that is going on in the Middle East today. But this is, you know, this week news. What is this funny cartoon? I'm going to complicate that a little bit more because it's not complicated enough. Uh, what is this cartoon? On the right over here, I don't know if you can recognize the guy, but in Israel everybody can recognize him. This is Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah. And he's holding a young boy, a baby. It's in Arabic, but you can see the flag. This is Lebanon. So. Hezbollah was supposed to be the proxy of Iran in the Middle East over here on Israel borders, but he became that big, fat, and rich that he's holding the poor Lebanon, and he's the one who is carrying Lebanon, and not the other way around, dragging Lebanon into war, uh, into this religious war between the Shiite and the Sunnis, and then there is another guy that is doing the same thing. This one uh, is <laughs> uh, one of Nimr's guys, one of the Shiite uh, in Yemen. And he's dragging Yemen, poor small Yemen, uh, into war, into this war between the Shiites and the Sunnis. So there are many wars today between Shiites and Sunnis uh, in different places, in Yemen, in Syria, and in Iraq. In Lebanon, it's a tension. In Bahrain, it's a tension. Uh, in Saudi Arabia, there is a tension. And this is the main conflict that, that we can talk about. Small summary. That's the map, a uh, Sunni Shiite map. It's very easy. 85% of the Muslim world are Sunnis. Only 15% are Shiite. I've been talking to about Sunnis and Shiite. Uh, I didn't explain what are these. Um, they're both Muslims. They both believe in the main pillars of Islam. But like Protestants and Catholics, uh, during the years they developed different theologies, different practices of religion, uh, and 
they, uh, it all began, you know, not with ideology. It all began in the early days of Islam with politics. After all, we are human. We can't only follow ideology. Uh, sometimes politics is even more important. And at the beginning, uh, early days of Islam, after Muhammad uh, passed away, uh, he didn't have any sons. They were looking for a successor and there was a disagreement within the Muslim community whether the successor should come from Muhammad's family, direct family, direct dynasty, meaning his son-in-law or his grandchildren, or whether he should come from the tribe, someone from the tribe. Sunnis believe that it can, it can be anybody from the tribe, while Shiites believe that it must be someone from this direct dynasty. And this is how it all had begun, but later, as I've said, it had developed into two different sects of Islam that are fighting each other brutally until today. If you try to explore the Sunni point of view, Saudi Arabia point of view, they are using the phrase Shiite crescent that is being evolved in the Middle East. And they're saying Iran is trying to uprise the Shiites wherever they live in the Middle East and to create a crescent from Yemen, later in Bahrain, later in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, and of course in Iran, which is 90% uh, Shiites. Well, I'm talking too much and I haven't mentioned ISIS, haven't I? And it's on the title of the lecture. What is ISIS? I've just said it developed in Iraq, but I'm, I'm not connecting it to this conflict of Shiite and Sunni thing. Well, ISIS managed to create enemies everywhere. Uh, first of all, as I've said, it's a Sunni organization. Uh, but whose proxy is it? I've said that Hezbollah is the proxy of Iran. Saudi Arabia has uh, other different proxies inside Syria that it is giving money to. Is ISIS a proxy? Well, the answer is no, actually. ISIS uh, split from Al-Qaeda. It had begun as a branch of Al-Qaeda, split from Al-Qaeda, and today it's nobody's proxy. But look at these cartoons. I like cartoons a lot. Due to this cartoon, the red one, ISIS is USA proxy. This cartoon was published in Turkish newspapers that support Erdogan, the, the president of Turkey. On the other hand, <coughs> in the upper cartoon, ISIS is the proxy of Iran. You can imagine who drawn this cartoon, probably by Saudi Arabia, uh, which identify Iran as its biggest enemy, as I've mentioned. So you can always accuse your main enemy that he's the one who support the monster. But ser seriously now, uh, ISIS was, uh, okay, it was uh, developed, uh, grew on the grassroots of frustration, Sunni frustration in Iraq. It's okay, it's part of the story. Another part of the story is Saudi Arabia. Most of ISIS fighters are Saudis. Uh, Bin Laden, the father of ISIS, uh, was Saudi. And Saudi Arabia gave the basic ideology to all this uh, uh, extreme ideology to, ev to evolve. Saudi Arabia practice in its uh, regime very extreme Islam. The Saudi tribe uh, 200 years ago had an alliance with a guy, cleric guy named Ad Abdel Wahab, who, the Wahhabi guy, who just wanted to go back to the um, original Islam wanted to go back to the days of Muhammad, wanted to go back to the glory days of the Muslim empire. That's fine. But by that also adopting costumes that were uh, appropriate to ancient times and not for today, like an hour for an iron and a tooth for a tooth. You know what I mean? You understand what I mean, but I will give you a small example. When I'm saying an eye for an eye, I mean that you burn a pilot, a Jordanian pilot, that bomb ISIS because he burned people. This is an eye for an eye. That's why they didn't behead the guy, just burned him. Yet, what all of that is connected to Israel? 
or Jews? Is it? Well, in order to explain or to answer that question, let's watch a short video. Uh, you're going to see of the 12th of June, 14, only a few days after ISIS got Mosul in Iraq, a, a Shiite poet in Baghdad, in a demonstration in Baghdad, uh, is giving a speech saying, we are not afraid of ISIS. We are brave enough. Look at that. يقول المتحدث باسم داعش سنزحف إلى بغداد تزحف تزحف البغداد من باشر تعال تزحف البغداد من باشر تعال أو ما تخوفنا ترى شباه الرجال احنا ولد الملحة جربنا القتال تزحف البغداد من باشر تعال اقبولكم والله حضرناها اسأل القبل اكلت بيه الجلال Until that moment, it was pretty clear. We discussed that. There are Shiites, there are the Sunnis, they are in, in deep conflict with each other. But now, he's taking a different direction. <laughs> ولو مو جائز تحاربها حرام ذو لخوتك بالرضاعة وبالكفور أبو رقضة طويريج باشر من نجيك يصير موتك سهل يا طويل العمر What the Jews got to do with all the death? Well, the answer is actually nothing. <laughs> We haven't got anything to do with that. But Due to the popular interpretation of the Quran, Jews are the sons of the apes and pigs. There is a phrase in the Quran, you should fight the sons of the apes and pigs, and popular interpretation says that they meant the Jews. Uh, during the years, Jews could live under, under Muslim control. It's okay, they can live. They won't be expelled, they won't get killed because they believe in the same God, also Christians. They believe in, we believe in Allah, we all believe in Elohim, Allah, God, it's the same one. Uh, but they should pay a very high tax and they should keep very low profile practicing their religion. Again, if I'm going to ISIS, for example, at the beginning ISIS expelled Christians, but later when it got a little bit more confidence, ISIS took the same position as it used to be in the different uh, Muslim empires and signed agreements with the Christian villages it occupied uh, with the same principles. Don't practice your religion in high profile, pay high taxes, this is a very good income, uh, and you can live, you can stay. Yet in the discourse, the Islamic discourse today, uh, Jews and Israel uh, are perceived as apes, pigs, using lots of uh, anti-Semitism uh, motives. Very similar to the motives that we've seen uh, in Europe 100 years ago, a little bit more, uh, less than 100 years ago. I don't know if you can get it. You can get this guy, right? It reminds us of what the same cartoon in Europe. IS, it's Islamic State. But behind it, there is Israel. It goes back to the question again, who's proxy? If you want to go against Israel, you use ISIS, saying ISIS is the proxy of Israel. And you draw these kind of, of cartoons. And this is just an example. There are many, many materials, like this poet, like these kind of cartoons in the same spirit. I just brought uh, very tight examples for that. And that's how you build a discourse. 
uh, which is not very positive. <coughs> How does it all translate into everyday reality in the northern border of Israel? Well, you see, I try to put the different flags over here. This is Israel, uh, northern border with Lebanon. And as I've said, it is actually under the control of Hezbollah over there. This is the flag of Hezbollah. Yellow flag is the flag of Hezbollah. There is also Lebanese uh, army there, but Hezbollah is the, the bully of the neighborhood. He actually the one who controls the neighborhood. On the other side, the border with Syria and the Golan Heights, as long as you go to the north near the Hermon Mountain, uh, it's still the control of Hezbollah and the Assad regime together. Uh, due to some of the rumors, Hezbollah already left, uh, mainly leaving Assad regime army and uh, some Shiite militias over there that were trained by Hezbollah, by Iranians, by Iranian generals that were there. How do we know that they were there? Because one of them was assassinated along with Hezbollah uh, terrorists over there. But uh, if some of you will come to visit over here, it's a very touristic place uh, on top of the Golan Heights, you could see the borderline between where the Assad regime is still controlling, Hezbollah is still controlling, and Al-Qaeda. This is Al-Qaeda flag. Yeah, because they are part of the rebels. So most of the Syrian Golan Heights are not under the control of the Assad regime again, anymore. Most of the border is under the control of the rebels. Only small strip is under the control of the Assad regime. Which flag is that? ISIS. So the southern part of the Syrian Golan Heights uh, Heights is under the control of ISIS. Now who is the enemy? Who is the potential enemy? Well, ISIS is still a potential enemy. Why potential? Because it haven't attacked us yet. But we do have to be prepared since there are 600 uh, fighters of ISIS on our border. They are well equipped, uh, they are very motivated, and now they are very busy. Busy in fighting the Assad regime. But uh, again, due to IDF generals that are talking uh, on about the different scenarios, there is always a fear that if they will be stressed enough in order to mobilize uh, new energy, they would attack Israel. Small example. Small example. Well, uh, how ISIS view Israel is something that also evolved. Yes, the, there is the basic ideology that I've shown you some example of it. But in public, when I began this business, uh, I typed Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi and, and, and Jews in Arabic in order to, to see whether he ever uh, published anything against us. It was a year and a half ago. And I haven't found anything. I just found, again, uh, different allegations that Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi's mother was Jewish. And then, uh, a few months ago, there was the first announcement of ISIS against Israel in Hebrew. Usually, using the phrases Al-Quds, Al-Quds is Jerusalem uh, in Arabic. Al-Aqsa is the um, Temple Mount. In Arabic. But two weeks ago, there's, there was another uh, message from Abu Bakr al Baghdadi himself to Israel, and now he used the word Palestine, which is quite untypical because ISIS is talking in religious terms, not in national terms. They don't care about the Palestinians. They, they, think, they don't think there should be any Palestine. Not Palestine, not Iraq, not Syria, no, none of these. They shouldn't be exist. Why did he use the word Palestine? In my assessment, because he wanted to recruit uh, young people. He wanted to mobilize them. Because uh, when you say Palestine, everybody understands. Let's fight. So this is the potential threat. These guys are controlling uh, 15 kilometers uh, along the border between Israel and, and Syria. Uh, and they have tanks, they have uh, suicide bombers, they know how to do all of that, different kind of weapons. And uh, IDF is trying to, uh, to create different mechanism of defense 
uh, in order to to be prepared to this kind of scenario. What about Hezbollah? Well, Hezbollah is not a potential enemy. Hezbollah is an enemy already. We had a few uh, times uh, of violent wars with Hezbollah. The next one, I hope it will never happen, but the next one will be totally different from everything we've experienced until today. Hezbollah of today is not the terrorist organization we used to know. It's not. It's a very strong army. Uh, Hillary Clinton, when she was uh, uh, Secretary of State a few years ago, said that Hezbollah made South Lebanon the biggest ammunition warehouse in the world. And she was correct. Uh, it's about 100,000 rockets that are still pointed to Israel, though Hezbollah is very busy in Syria. And Hezbollah got free training in Syria. So some, some of Hezbollah fighters are not coming back because they die in Syria, but when they do come back, when some of them do come back alive, they are well trained, they are combat uh, soldiers, they know how to handle a battle with a few hundred soldiers in urban areas, and they don't care about civilians, of course they don't. They didn't read the international law about that. And, and they are talking, uh, Nasrallah is talking out loud. That other than the rockets, Hezbollah has uh, new capabilities that he developed, such as infiltrating into Israel. Well, he had, it had done that in the past, but not with small groups of, I don't know, about five to ten uh, soldiers, but with company or a battalion, or maybe even more than that. Nasrallah is talking about 5,000 people. Let's assume he's exaggerating. Let's go for 50. 50 troops that will try to take one of the Jewish communities along the border, and there are many like that. This is pretty dangerous. So IDF today is trying to be prepared to both threats. The potential one that might evolve, which is ISIS or Al-Qaeda, and the one that already exists, which is Hezbollah. Any good news <laughs> after all of that? Yeah, there are good news. There are always good news. Yeah. This is America. In Hollywood, the movies always end with the good, the good ending, right? I must be optimistic. I'm so, okay. So, what's the good news? <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> well, yeah, the enemy of my enemy is not my friend, but the friend of my enemy is not my enemy. <laughs> Surprisingly enough. Putin came to the region, or Russia came to the region to help Assad, to help the Shiite alliance, which is Iran, Assad regime, and Hezbollah. This is the Shiite alliance, and I don't have any positive words about them. And yet, uh, Israel and Russia are coordinated. They are. We have a hotline. Whenever anything uh, is happening, uh, IDF officers can talk with Russian officers in Syria and calm things down. Heard what happened between Turkey and Russia? Turkey um, uh, intercepted, uh, I don't know if the word intercepted is correct, but uh, shot a Russian airplane. Now, both Turkey and Russia have, leaders have very big ego and they've got very much insulted from each other uh, words about this incident and it caused to a crisis between these two countries. We want to avoid this kind of scenario. And since I'm uh, from the military, I know that there is no 100%. There is never a 100%. But we're doing our best to avoid this kind of scenario. And that's why Netanyahu went to Russia to create a way of coordination between Israel and, and Russia, in order to avoid this kind of scenario. Now, I'm trying to explain how delicate this is all. Uh, two examples. First, Defense Israeli Defense Minister did a, did a very good job for me, because he uh, talked on public and said that there were a few occasions already that Russian airplanes already crossed into Israel from Syria, crossed, you know, because they are attacking near the border, so it's easy, there is no fence in the sky. And nothing happened. Now you know that whenever Syrian airplane crossed, it was shot by IDF. It was. It happened. 
but the Russians' airplane were not shot. I hope, again, there is not 100% in the military, but this is what we're trying to do. Second example, and I'm going to talk very carefully, but you can understand between the lines. Uh, during the years, there were a few attacks, about 15 attacks, that's quite a lot, uh, against uh, convoys of ammunition from Syria to Lebanon, ammunition that was meant to get to Hezbollah, strategic ammunition, such as the SCADs or uh, anti-aircraft systems, and they were bombed by someone. Now, how do you do that when there are Russian airplanes in the sky? Yeah, you do, <laughs> somehow. Uh, there were a few assassinations I uh, mentioned one of them while uh, an Iranian general got killed before the Russians came. But there was another assassination a month ago against an architect named Samir Kuntar. Uh, heard about the guy? Well, uh, if you're patient enough, I'll, I'll tell you the story about this guy. Um, this guy, uh, I'm saying architect since he crossed the border in 1979 from Lebanon to Israel, uh, killed, massacred. A father and, a girl and his daughter in Naharia, it's not far from where I live, it's the northern town on the seashore in Israel. <coughs> and uh, we caught him. Right after he killed them, the officers got to him, a uh, policeman got to him and he, they caught him. And he sat in jail for, 40, for 30 years, almost 30 years, and then he was released due to a deal of exchange of prisoners. And the moment he got released, he went back to terrorism. He went back, not to Lebanon, to Syria, to establish Hezbollah terrorist cell in Syria. And a month ago, someone killed him in Damascus with airplanes that launched missiles. This is due to uh, public uh, uh, sources, open sources. And he died. How could someone fly when the sky belongs to the Russians? Well, you, you can, if you coordinate. Uh, and then what happened, just to finish the story, and then Nasrallah came and promised revenge. On the news, we listen to Nasrallah very carefully. It's a language. It's not always verbal, but it's a language. And when he promised revenge, we knew it's going to be revenge. So we closed the border. Closed the border, meaning I, I accompany groups on the borderline between Israel and Syria and between Israel and Lebanon. This month I couldn't accompany any group to the Lebanese border. It was closed. Only those who are living nearby the border could go there. Uh, because we knew that uh, Hezbollah is going uh, to retaliate on the border. Because we listen. We listen. Not, not we listen with intelligence. That's... That's another business. We listen to the language. This is what I mean. And finally, uh, probably because it was difficult, but main reason because Nasrallah himself didn't want any war with Israel. They usually, these guys usually don't want war with Israel. They just want to make our lives unbearable. So uh, eventually what happened is that uh, mines that were planted on the borderline uh, exploded against IDF patrol. No one got hurt since IDF knew there was an intelligent alert that something is going to happen. IDF used, you know, if you heard the name D9, which are big tractors that are supposed to be protected from these kind of, of uh, mines. No one got hurt. Next uh, question for intelligence officer, will it be enough for Hezbollah? Is that enough? reading the newspaper the next morning, trying to understand the language, to listen to the language, Hezbollah said that this attack was very successful and they tried to get a senior from the Mossad. And I think it's enough. We closed the, the bill until next time. So that, that's the, the whole story about, uh, you know, conflict in the Middle East that in the end, come to our doors, though we are not necessarily connected to this conflict. Uh, I would be happy to answer your questions.
Yes. Well, Russians are not uh, coordinating with Israel because they are Zionist. And I guess they are also not helping the Assad regime because they became Shiites. So, yes, Putin in one hand can give ammunition to Hezbollah, and on the other hand coordinate with Israel. It's totally logical for him to do that. He doesn't feel that he has to pick one side or another. If he can benefit from both sides, what's the problem with that? It's different kind of logic. It's not bad guys or good guys. It's who I can have business with. If I can have business with these Israelis, okay. If I can have business with Hezbollah, it's okay. Yeah. More questions? Can civilian Israeli carry a, if you want to conceal something, is there crime in the United States? Not weapons, I know it's legal, but there are criminals everywhere. Uh, police job is to stop them. Why are you asking? I don't, I don't see where it goes. Sharon. Yeah. In one of my briefings, someone asked the same question, but a little bit differently. Why aren't you doing anything? You know there are uh, tons of rockets pointed at you, and you're doing anything. You are here, you feel safe, you raise your kids. How come you're doing nothing? And then I, I was astonished by the question, and then I, someone else from the group told him, because this is Israeli defense forces, and not offense forces. So yes, once Israel took a preemptive attack, it was the Six Days War. We did. Concerning Hezbollah, I know uh, uh, something really big or maybe very good intelligence about something that is going to happen in order to cause us to uh, take preemptive attack. But there is another thing. These rockets created a balance of deterrence between us and, and Hezbollah. Because we know the price of another war, and that this is what I said, it, it's going to be totally different. And Hezbollah knows the price of another war, because all these rockets are hidden inside the homes or under the homes. And again, I'm, going, I'm telling you that from very personal experience. We don't want to kill any Lebanese. We don't. I don't know if you can see how sincere I am. Um, but we don't. And this is a problem. And it creates a balance of deterrence. Because we know that if we're going to get into war with Hezbollah, we'll have to bomb all these rockets on the one hand. And we're going to suffer because you can't bomb them in two seconds. We're going to suffer from rockets, they will be fired at us, and they are very accurate and to, the, to various ranges. So, you, you leave it that way. It's not an easy decision. Uh, but you, you are being prepared for the day of escalation, all the time. Yes. I'll put it this way, okay, uh, with your permission. Uh, I hope that if Assad will fall and there will be one governess in Syria, 
let's say rebels, uh, we will be able to, to get the same unwritten agreement. But if we want, and I really don't know, if we want, at least we're going to have one government. Either to gather information, to go to war, or to negotiate peace. Whatever you choose. The situation today is that there is no government, so it's a mixture of different groups and terrorist groups that you got to know all of them, follow all of them, and give the answers whenever any one of them attacks you, and you can never get an agreement with any of them. So I prefer one government, doesn't matter what government, it's their own business uh, that I can deal with. Yes. Well, I see it this way. It's like a relationship between an employer and, and its boss. If you go to your boss and you recommend something, the boss decides eventually. But you can recommend, you can influence on your boss' opinion. So it's something like that. It, 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 is, a, it is a dialogue between Hezbollah and, and the boss. There are many more players. You, you haven't mentioned, if you mentioned the Muslim Brotherhood, you should mention also Hamas. And, and this is what's beautiful about it, yes. Uh, Saudi Arabia pressed Hamas in summer 14 to get ceasefire agreement with Israel. So Israel found itself in the same interest with Saudi Arabia. And I guess, I can only guess, that there is some kind of coordination dialogue, whatever, secret dialogue, coordination with Saudi Arabia. Though it's extreme Islam. Again, it's not only ideology, it's also interest. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much.